Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends welcome to the class of public international law the topic that we will discuss now is territory and jurisdiction i am dr ashutosh acharya senior assistant professor law center 2 faculty of law university of delhi well the topic territory and jurisdiction is an extension from the topic that we discussed in the last class that is subjects of international law where we identify that since the states are the primary subjects of international law territory is an essential component in order to constitute a state there is no territory there is no state therefore it is pertinent to understand how territories come into existence how territories change their shape how boundaries are changed and when they change what happens how the concept or the idea of territory being defined comes into being and especially we see all of this happening when the idea of non expansionism comes into being all these states wanted a bigger territorial boundary all the political authorities especially in europe or in asia we can say wanted a bigger territory the inner demand for the same is still in existence it is only because of the international legal system in place and balance of power that we see in order to avoid destruction of any kind be it of property or to people the states tend to avoid the policy of expansionism even if they expand they try to justify on the grounds of international politics balance of power security concerns maintenance of peace and others however all these states maintain on the face of it the policy of non expansionism that they don't they are not expanding their territory under the idea of enlarging their territory because that that particular idea is nowadays deemed to be not so legitimate so if any state is expanding itself or expanding its territory expanding its jurisdiction then it is doing so under the garb of or under the name of making it to be legitimate that is that they are doing it in the name of self defense or in the name of peace or in the name of security so taking the arguments of the modern positivism that is maintenance of peace and security international peace and security protecting people recognition of right to self determination under this idea under this garb the states try to expand their territory so what is the whole scenario legal scenario as far as territory under international law is concerned will be discussed today and within that territory the states exercise their jurisdiction so the objectives for the day would be to understand the meaning territory and its ap actual application to understand the relationship between territory and exercise of sovereignty to learn different modes of acquisition of territory in international sphere we will also look at the role of use of force and the contemporary dilemma of legitimization of acquisition of territory acquired through use of force to learn about different types of jurisdiction well friends let us first understand the idea of state as far as territory being the constituent element is concerned as i said territory is an important element over which a population resides and over which 
the political authority exercises its control and for which international relations are entered into that is for the people to be applicable within the given territory. Internally the supremacy of governmental institutions and externally supremacy of a state as a legal personnel. Foundation of sovereignty this is founded on territory, no territory is equal to no sovereignty. So, if we say that the sovereignty is to be kept intact, so sovereignty is to be maintained, there is equality of relationship between states, that means we must respect the territorial integrity of each other. If the territory is controlled by some other state or if the territory is affected by some other state, that means sovereignty is affected or vice versa if the sovereignty is affected that means control over a territory gets affected. So, they are interlinked with each other, they cannot be separated from each other. So, if there is exercise of sovereignty it means the exercise of sovereignty is over a territory. So, therefore, no territory is equal to no sovereignty. Legal nature of territory becomes a vital part in any study of international law, whether a territory is legal or not legal, whether it is occupied through illegal means or it is occupied through legal means or it has been and sold to another state or it has been found by a particular state. What are the situations as far as legal aspect is concerned? What is the legal position with respect to different types of territories? We will discuss that. But one thing is clear and that is the legal nature of territory is an essential part in any study of international law. International law revolves around largely around the aspects of territory. It is the territory which concerns mostly to the states. The land territory is an essential aspect or essential topic or essential area or subject matter of discussion between the states. If states do not have a territory or states lose out their territory, it is of utmost importance that they regain control, that they exercise their political authority over that territory. So, territory has to be there for existence of a state and not only that, it must be under its control, it must if it is occupied, what is the legal status? Law tries to answer in a certain manner as to what will be the legal status of territories that are occupied, that are taken under control by a particular state. The development of legal rules have been protecting inviability of land. So, as I said that post second world war, even before that, but especially after second world war, especially after coming into being of United Nations charter United Nations organization. We see that in the last 75 or more than that years or so, we have seen change of approach, change of approach with respect to acquisition of territory or territories and that is to maintain boundaries. Now, the reasons may be different, the reasons may be good faith, but all of us know there are other reasons also in existence and those reasons are based on military powers, those reasons are based on balance of power largely. So, states divided into north, south, east, west having different types of blocks with in the name of collective security or any other kind of joint security measures try to maintain the balance of power so that territories whatever are in existence must continue to be the same. There must be stability amongst the states as far as territorial control is concerned, as far as territories are concerned. It brings certainty as far as dealings of states with each other are concerned. Secondly, norms prohibiting internal affairs. United Nations Charter says, that no state should interfere into the matters of other state and this includes territorial matters. For example, if a particular state is having jurisdiction within the territorial waters or is having a certain type of enforcement jurisdiction in contiguous zone in the sea water attached to a particular coastal state, the coastal state 
is having the right under United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea to exercise appropriate jurisdiction. No other state can interfere with that designated jurisdiction that a coastal state can exercise. On the land territory, if there is jurisdiction of a particular state in the given matters, other state cannot have jurisdiction. Having jurisdiction over matters pertaining to other state can disturb the aspects of territorial integrity and sovereignty. Jurisdiction is an essential aspect of any sovereign nation. Exercise of jurisdiction is a right of any sovereign nation. Violating or entering into the internal matters by not allowing the concerned state to exercise its jurisdiction can reach to or can lead to breach of sovereignty or breach of territorial integrity as far as exercise of jurisdiction is concerned. Interdependence has led to reduction in exclusivity of territory. Yes, certainly territories have been to an extent affected otherwise as well. When we say that it is the internal law that will be applicable as far as a particular nation a state is concerned. In that situation, it is the prerogative of the domestic law to be applicable first and that is so also happens. But at the same time, we have seen that there are internal laws that gets affected by international law. We had discussed in one of the previous topics that we discussed called relationship between international law and municipal law, where we saw that how domestic law gets affected by the application of international law or by coming into force of international law or by the making of international law. Therefore, we see that wherever there is interdependence, wherever there is uh, wherever there are there are states dependent on the international legal system or wherever whenever they enter into international relationship they tend to dilute to an extent the domestic legal system aspect we see that rise of inter transnational concerns we see that rise of transnational concerns as maintenance of human rights and self determination becomes obligation of states earlier we used to see that states can determine and decide their own political authority. The states are free to identify as to what method of go governance would be applicable, whether it would be a monarchy, an autocracy or a colonization or a democratic setup. Because earlier there was no international legal pressure and there was no question of legality or legitimacy. Yes, certainly legitimacy has been very uh, complexly existing. However, there was no law prohibiting states from doing any such activity with respect to having an autocratic government or having a democratic government or having a monarchy. It is in the last century that we see movement towards realization and recognize, recognize, recognition of right to self-determination. And through this, we see that states now tend to expand the idea of democracy. Different international organizations that take care of human rights, especially United Nations organization or international blocs or the dominant countries of the globe are purporting and advocating the establishment of democratic setups around the globe in different states. So, the decision as to what kind of pol political authority would be in existence is in question as to the answer to this question is only one and that is that the primary objective should be to recognize and realize human rights of the people. The people be it be they, they may be residing in certain Middle East countries, they may be residing in African nations, they may be residing in Asia, they may be residing in Europe, wherever they are residing. The aspect of human rights protects the rights of all individuals irrespective 
of the place they belong, irrespective of the race they belong, irrespective of the gender they belong to. So, in order to secure and protect the rights of especially the marginalized sections, which can include women, people belonging to certain minority race or people belonging to other kind of minorities which are based on religion or caste or creed or any other ground. So, in order to protect these minorities, in order to protect certain people living in any part of the world, the aspect of human rights has been promoted. This can be witnessed through UDHR, ICCPR, ECOSOC and other conventions, covenants and declarations. Its states are now under an obligation to respect human rights. So, international law somewhere down the line obligates or puts an obligation upon the states, thereby diluting the aspects of sovereignty. At the same time, we see that the territories gets affected largely by the aspects of self-determination as far as their political authority is concerned. The growth of international organization has also reduced the exclusivity of territory. The isolation of territory has been done away with largely because of the formation of international organization because if you want to become member of international organization and that and also a state would want to become in today's time a member of different international organizations, especially organizations dealing with trade, economic aspects. Since there is so much of interdependence, the growth in today's world and enjoyment of progressive developments in the field of science and technology and pharma can only be made possible, available in interna internal system only if the state is part of these international organizations. If a state is not part of international organization, perhaps it would lead to problems in internal matters as well, less economic development, less progressive uh, developments, less progression as far as economy, finance and other scientific technological developments are concerned. So, if a state wants to be a participative uh, or a state wants to have a participative role or if a state wants to take advantages of the new developments that are taking place around the globe, then it will have to become a member or a part of these international organization and ultimately it affects the idea of territoriality or you can say the exclusivity of territory. Also the development of common heritage concept in the context of sea and air law has led to exclusivity of reduction in the exclusivity of territory. A major chunk of area be it in sea or all of the space or celestial bodies are now declared to be common heritage of mankind. That means that they belong to all since it is common and it is designated to be a heritage which means that it is to be now protected and not only consumed or not only to be destructive. So, in order to protect it from any kind of destruction or degradation, it has been now categorized as a heritage, which is common to all humanity, mankind. So, common heritage is the concept that comes into being in the last century, where most of the sea area and air space regions, celestial bodies are designated as common heritage of mankind. So, earlier if states could identify certain um, territory which belong to none, they could establish their territorial jurisdiction or their territory or they could declare that particular new piece of land to be their territory and it will belong to them. But nowadays, we have identified all the land territories. We also have laws pertaining to see that if resources or new resources are found in high seas and not in the coastal waters of a particular coastal state that falls within the EEZ contiguous zone or continental shelf or territorial waters of a particular state, then that particular resource would belong to all and not to one particular state or certain states because that is having a different categorization. So, the aspect of territory is also circumscribed to an extent as far as the new or modern or contemporary approach is concerned. 
Now, we also see changing sovereignty over territory, how sovereignty can change or how sovereignty can come into being as far as a territory is concerned. Territorial sovereignty is a concept where the sovereign exercise its sovereign rights over the given territory. Now, how things can come into being, how claims can be made? Let us discuss the aspect of territorial sovereignty through a particular case and this is known as Island of Palamas case. It is a case which was referred to, referred for arbitration. It is a case between Netherlands and United States of America. It is a case which concerns dispute between the two states over island of Palamas for ownership of the island of Palamas. Now, this case was sent for arbitration in, and claim was brought into being in to the beginning of 20th century. Now, let me give you a brief facts of island of Palamas case. Island of Palamas was discovered in 17th century by Spain firstly as it sailed near Philippines and to control over Philippines, it colonized Philippines. After it identified or found out or discovered a piece of land which is island of Palamas was resided on by certain small tribal group. It went on to put its flag which lost its existence after a certain period of time. Later on, the Dutch from Netherlands found this island and continued to show their presence in that particular island by either residing in the island or entering into agreement with the locals of the island. They continued their existence for 200 years or more than 200 years. For these more 200 years, Spain did not object to the existence and presence of the Netherlands into the island. Later on in the last decade of the 19th century, Spain lost war against United States of America and as a result under a settlement agreement, Spain handed over Philippines and its attachments to United States of America and as a result, United States of America immediately went on to claim its ownership over the island of Palamas since it, it based its claim on the basis that Spain has handed over its Philippines and all of its attachments to United States of America and Spain is the state that had discovered this particular island. So, whether the territory that is the island of Palamas belongs to Spain and then as a result to United States of America. The argument of United States of America was based on a particular right and that right was based on the aspect and idea of terra nullius. So, terra nullius means territory which has not been discovered by anyone. So, the earlier right and even to an extent it exists today, but is of no significance because all was, almost all of the territories are now discovered. But earlier it did exist because all of the territories were not discovered. So, one who discovers a particular territory can have a preferential right and a claim or you can say ownership over that particular territory. Now, here Spain is the state that had discovered this particular territory and under the right to discovery is Spain will have a preferential right or ownership over the island of Palamas. Whereas, Netherlands went on to claim and say that it had continued to live for more than 200 years or near about 200 years and no objection was raised by Spain as far as its continuous presence and peaceful existence in the island is concerned. So, since there has been peaceful existence and continuation and effective control over the state. Spain did not have effective control over the island of Palamas. Netherlands had the effective control over the island of Palamas and therefore, it must be allowed to continue or you can say since the possession has been for so long, it is the one who should get the ownership of the island of Palamas. Judge Max Huber said in this case, 
sovereignty in relation to a portion of the surface of the globe is the legal condition necessary for inclusion of such portion in the territory of any particular state. When we talk about territory, we talk about fullest rights over territory. So, who was exercising fullest rights over territory? It was Netherlands who were exercising fullest rights over territory. So, under the reasoning of effective control, under the reasoning of peaceful existence, continuity of possession, it was decided by Judge Max Huber in the arbitration claims between Netherlands and US that the island of Palamas does not belong to US since it never belonged to Spain. Spain never claimed its right over island of Palamas on the basis of right to discovery. Therefore, right to discovery must be in continuation. Continuity is an essential factor to have territory under your control. Since the continuity was not in existence by Spain, but by Netherlands it was in place and therefore, Netherlands is the owner or gets the ownership rights over the island of Palamas. Territorial sovereignty has positive exclusivity and negative aspects. That is, positive aspect of territorial sovereignty would be that it has exclusivity in that particular given territory and negative aspect is that it has duty towards other aspects as we see it under United Nations Charter. Municipal law looks at territory or land from different legal points that is from the point of view of ownership and possession. However, international law is more absolute than relative that is who places a better title. Claims to territory may be based on number of different grounds ranging from traditional method of occupation prescription to the newer concepts such as self-determination along with various political, geographical, historical and legal factors. So, if you look at the basis, basic idea of having or acquiring a territory, we will see different ranging grounds which comes into being either through prescription or through occupation or through secession, session and other modes. But if you look at the newer concept, the newer idea is largely based on self-determination, based on the right to self-determination along with various political, geographical, historical and legal factors, we can identify claims to territory. We have seen state, new states coming into being largely on the basis of right to self-determination. We have seen states getting merged largely on the basis of right to self-determination because people of the territory want to merge with each other. So, in different given scenarios and for the same one may refer to our previous lecture that is lecture number 5 on subjects of international law where we see how the merger or demerger etcetera has taken place. The examples of the same has also been discussed. So, with this new idea being accepted by different states. Uh, United Nations organization accepted by Security Council which can be depicted through certain resolutions also. We see that territories or claim to territories are based on newer grounds differing or advancing from the older grounds. The older grounds were terra nullius and res communis. As I said terra nullius can be said to have been not in existence so far. It, since it talks about territory which was not in existence or which was not identified and now is identified. So, whosoever discovers it will have the right over it. But then if you refer to island of Palamas, if you read island of Palamas together with the right to discovery, it must be combined with continuity and control as far as a particular claim over the territory is concerned. We also have the idea of res communis. Res means property in communis comes from communities. Therefore, we can say the territorial sovereignty or sovereignty over the territory can be exercised also by having a claim under res communis that is property of the community. So, the previous idea was terra nullius and res communis. Res communis declares a property not to be belonging to one particular state, but belonging to everyone. It is a property of everyone which can be exhausted and utilized by all. 
But nowadays this idea is also taken a shift and this shift is from res communis to common heritage of mankind and that is that earlier whosoever wants to use a common property can use. But then there is a problem. The problem is that whosoever is in a position to use the common property will be able to use. The capacity is based on the competence to use it. So, since certain developed states are economically, technologically more advanced, they will be in a better position to use the property which is common in nature. But in the mid and late 20th century, under various conventions or through various conventions such as UNCLOS being the one of them and also outer space convention or air and space under air and space law, we see that the common property is now considered to be common heritage. That is, we must not exhaust, we must not use it for one singular purposes, rather we must save it for the future generation to come. And these future generations are not coming in only one or few states, but are coming in all these states and therefore, all these states must regulate it instead of exhausting it as fast as possible. So, we must slow down the process, we must rethink the legal system that we had previously developed. So, the new legal regime that we see in the international legal system is little bit towards saving the property, saving the territories which are common in nature and not allowing exclusivity over the common properties. There is less discussion on legal rights to land and more stress on legal compliance to statehood and acceptance by other states. Now, how do you acquire an additional territory? Because when you talk about territory, territories change as I have already told you. Now, how these territories expand change? So, there are five modes of acquisition. The first mode being the terra nullius. That means, as I have already told you, no one's territory. And as I have told you earlier, there was existence of right to discovery. If any state discovers a particular state, a particular piece of land which may be an island also, that particular state will have the preferential right over that particular territory. Prescription and then you have session and then you have accretion which means gradual growth. Japanese island Iwo Jima in Pacific emerged due to volcanic eruption. This was first identified by a British satellite. Later on Japanese authorities were informed to take control over the island which is situated near to the Japan. The same argument of proximity was raised in island of Palamas case. We see that US went on to claim that since island of Palamas is in proximity to Philippines, it is the Philippines that must have the control over the island. However, Max Huber refused such argument. It said, it went on to say that if such an argument of proximity is accepted, then many states would lose their control over the territories that they have acquired beyond their own territory. So, such an argument also does not find place in law as far as proximity as a ground towards claim of the island is concerned. Yes, proximity provides you convenience as far as control over the territory is concerned. However, it cannot be a legal ground or legal reasoning as far as control over a particular territory is concerned subjugation or conquest. So, let us start with cession. Cession means transfer of territory from one sovereign to another. The acquiring state cannot possess more rights than its predecessor state had. So, if one territory or if a piece of territory transfers to another particular state, then we can say it is cession. In addition to cession, we also have secession where a particular territory secedes to form a new state. If a particular territory does not separate to form a new state, but separates to be added into some other states, then it is cession. But if it separates from the original territory to form a new state, then it will be known as secession or seceding from the original territory. Territories are also acquired through conquest, that is use of force. We have multiple examples where through use of force or through conquest, 
territories have been acquired in the past. In today's time, it is prohibited to acquire territory through use of force or by use of force. It has been prohibited under Article 2 of the United Nations Charter that any state use force and acquire territory or use force for any other matter as well in general. Especially to acquire territory, use of force must not be utilized. Now, the crucial question here is how far a title based on force can be regarded as valid, legal right, recognizable by other states and enforceable within international system. Since we say that use of force is not allowed, it is prohibited, it is considered to be illegal and if territory is acquired through use of force, how far can we say that it is valid or it is or the acquisition over the territory is legal, how other states get to recognize. The ethical considerations are at place and the principle that an illegal act cannot give birth to a right in law, an essential component in orderly society. So, largely if territory is acquired through use of force or through conquest, it does not get recognized initially or it should not be. I am not saying that it will not be recognized in future, but in law it is not considered to be recognized or it should not be recognized. So, legally it will be still an illegal acquisition. Later on it may be recognized due to change in circumstances or due to some other reasons or due to continuous possession by a particular state over the acquired territory through use of force or maybe states will recognize because they support such an acquisition due to establishing certain good international relationships. In reciprocity also states go on to recognize each other's territory. If there are two states, both the states have acquired territory illegally, they may recognize their new territorial boundaries in reciprocity. So, there are methods through which we see that politics can be used, wherein politics can be used to recognize the new territories which have been undertaken by use of force or through conquest. Now, politics as I said plays a very significant role as far as law is concerned. So, international law per se prima facile treat such acts or such acquisition of territories to be illegal, but politics can at a later point of time rectify that particular aspect or justify that particular aspect or cover up that particular aspect. However, exigencies of reality are to be taken into account by international law and this happens through recognition by other states. So, as I said, states can recognize the territories which have been acquired through conquest or by use of force. Earlier war was considered to be inevitable and whosoever wins takes the land. However, with time policy shift happened. For example, Kellogg Brand Pact in 1928 war to be outlawed as internal policy. 1970 declaration on principles of international law by United Nations General Assembly says the territory of a state shall not be the object of acquisition by another state resulting from threat or use of force. No territory acquisition or no territorial acquisition resulting from the threat or use of force shall be recognized as legal. So, as I said friends that the method is not considered to be legal but later on at a later point of time though we see and it is a fact that through recognition states do get recognized even if acquired through use of force or conquest. Now, it is seen if the state is having effective control and there must be no chance of former sovereign regaining its territory. So, we have to judge the situation, different states recognizing this new acquisition through conquest or use of force will wait for some time and think over the acquisition that has taken place, that whether there is a chance that the former sovereign can regain control over the territory. In such a situation, if there are chances, the states will wait and not hasten in rec giving recognition to such acquisition through conquest or use of force. So, wherever there is 
a conquest or use of force and new territory has undertaken in the already existing territory, it will see that whether there is a chance of effective control, whether effective control is in existence, whether there is peaceful coexistence between the people of the acquired territory and the people of the already existing territory. So, based on various factors, judging the factors existing in that particular region, states go on to decide that whether the recognition be given or not. Germany in 1939 and 1940, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and Security Council resolution to not recognize it. So, even if Iraq invaded Kuwait, US did not recognize it and later on passed a resolution against Iraq and ousted Iraq from Kuwait. Israel's extension of laws at Golan Heights, UN had condemned such act. Now, as we talk about effective control, because it is based on the effective control only that whether a territory will be considered to be part of the already existing territory or not. So, it is the effective control through which we see that whether the state's expansion has happened or not. And this can be seen through occupation and prescription. Now, occupation here means that it is a method of acquiring territory which belongs to no one, that is terra nullius. Whereas, if acquisition of territory happens over a territory which was not terra nullius, then it would be known as prescription. That is the difference between occupation and prescription. Having a territory, occupying a territory which belongs to none, then it is occupation. Occupying a territory which belonged to someone else, then it would be prescription. But then there is a process of prescription, we will come to it. Occupation here, as I said, is a method of acquiring territory which belongs to no one. In 15th and 16th century, mere realization of a particular piece of land was sufficient which could be evidenced through raising a flag or establishing a sophisticated ritual. The example of which again can be Island of Palamas case where US is claiming that a Spain came here first that is on the island of Palamas and placed its flag over the island of Palamas. So, such claim was allowed at that point of time. However, with time conditions changed and we see that it is not only right to discovery, but also continuous and effective continuous existence and peaceful existence and exercise of effective control over the piece of land, which entails ownership and possession to a particular state over a particular territory. A prescription is a mode of acquiring territory or establishing title to territory which is not terra nullius. Legitimization of a doubtful title by the passage of time and presumed acquiescence of the sovereign need for stability in international system by recognizing the territory in the possession of that state for a long period of time and uncontested cannot be taken away from that state without serious consequences for international order. It is a legitimization of fact. Possession must be peaceful and uninterrupted. Apart from the case of island of Palamas, we can also take the example of temple of Previhar case. Whether the region belonging to temple of Previhar belonged to Cambodia or to Thailand was the issue in Cambodia versus Thailand case. Now, here court did apply the principle of acquiescence or estoppel, wherein it said that Thailand for a longer period of time did not oppose, did not raise objection for exercise of sovereignty over the regions including temple of Previhar. So, therefore, it can be deemed that it has acquiesced to the situation that is given. So, in order to maintain a stability and in order to not to disturb the stability and allow the already existing state to carry on its possession in the given territory. So, as a matter of uh, stability, we see that states go for recognition and in order to not disturb the given situation further, in order to not bring in turmoil between the states as far as territories are concerned, it is better to maintain a status quo that is legitimizing the acquisition. And when such legitimization happens, it is known as prescription. Chamizal arbitration case, Rio Grande rivers changed the course. US claimed grounds between old and new river beds, partly on the basis of peaceful 
an uninterrupted possession. This view was dismissed as there was constant protest by Mexico. So, protest is an essential criteria be it temple of Previar case, be it your island of Palamas case or be it Shamizal arbitration case. In all these cases, we see protest or raising objection with respect to exercise of sovereignty over a particular territorial unit becomes an important factor. So, here in Shamizal arbitration case, we see Mexico had raised objection persistently and therefore, we can say that US is not having a, uh, ownership over the given um, river bed where from where the river had shifted. This protest can be diplomatic, it need not be aggressive, it need not be amounting to use of force and therefore, diplomatic protest will sufficient not resorting to war does not show that it was peaceful, even peaceful protest is sufficient to show that there is no unilateral ownership getting recognized. Another case is Minquiris and Ekrehos case wherein disputed sovereignty over a group of islets and rocks in English channel can be identified. ICJ examined the history, grounds uh, for the decision that it laid down were exercise of jurisdiction and local administration as well as nature of legislative enactments referable to the territory in question. British sovereignty was upheld. So, we see that wherever there is effective control and this effective control can be identified by exercise of jurisdiction in that particular area. So, exercise of jurisdiction is one of the important or can be a cottage uh, outcome as, as far as the test of effective control over a territory is concerned. So, therefore, we can conclude that if you want to identify that whether a particular territory belongs to a particular state or not, then we must show continuous and peaceful display of territorial sovereignty. It is as good as title, the public or open nature of control is essential. Isolated control will not do, a secretive control will not suffice. The control must be in public, it must be open and, and it the, these are the essential factors to identify that whether territorial sovereignty by a state exists in a given territory or it does not. Recognition through resolutions to prevent effective control from ever hardening into title. Concerning Iraqi annexation, United Nations Security Council resolution that was passed in 1990-662, significance of United Nations resolution is self adopted evident. Adopting resolution ending a territorial dispute by determining boundary in question that is between Iraq and Kuwait and that both parties agreed in 1963. Now, friends we see that territorial integrity, self-determination are the new criteria that has come into picture. Apart from territorial integrity and self-determination identifying the territorial sovereignty, we also have certain other claims which are known as sundry claims. They do not fall in the main regime of territorial sovereignty, but still there are territories, there are claims with respect to territories and they will be known as sundry claims. So, when you talk about territorial integrity, self-determination, we have the principle of territorial integrity under article 2 clause 7 and 2 clause 4. 2 clause 7 of the United Nations Charter talks about non-intervention in domestic affairs and to clause 4 of the United Nations Charter talks about non-use of force. There is conflict with the principle of right to self-determination. Of course, there will be conflict because if there is already a status quo maintained with respect to a territory, right to self-determination can be a point of dispute starting with respect to realization of ethnic identity. So, if there are multiple ethnic groups residing in a given territory, the aspect of article 2 clause 7 and 4 will say that there must not be intervention in domestic affairs by other states, there must not be use of force by other states against that particular state. Even if the ethnic groups does not want to stay with the within the given territory, the idea is dangerous for the idea of a state itself. Because if you give preference to the idea of right to self-determination and give more relaxation and there is a flexible acceptability to it, it can lead to dangerous results also that would be disturbing the whole 
set setup of international legal system which is based on the idea of a state so somewhere down the line the idea of right to self determination helps the state to maintain equality freedoms and maintain human rights but at the same time it can affect the existing existing idea of a state because if minority ethnic groups or certain ethnic groups does not want to stay along with other ethnic groups it would certainly demand for a new state in such a situation if a state fails to protect the rights of those minority ethnic groups those ethnic groups would then demand for a new state and this can be dangerous for the whole idea of a state under international law and we have seen also in the past that when a when number of states parted with their ways from each other for example from yugoslavia we saw a new eight states comes coming into being the reason basically was ethnic clashes the the minority groups or certain different ethnic uh, ethnic groups were not ready to stay together and as a result we see clashes we saw breaking of yugoslavia into eight different countries so we can see that there are positive aspects somewhere down the line it can help the state if it is if a state wishes to take help from the idea of right to self determination but at the same time it is dangerous it can be misused also in order to devolve the idea of a state now when it is in conflict with the principle of right to self determination we see that it is applicable mostly in non independent states and doesn't promote secession so it came up as an idea to remove colonization from different states but then it has been used later on as well as i have already pointed out there is a doctrine of uti possidetis juris and which means as you possess under law again in order to maintain the stability as far as territory and territorial integrity is concerned the doctrine of uti possidetis juris says as you possess under law and it's a principle of international law which provides that newly formed sovereign states should retain the internal borders that their preceding dependent area had before their independence resolution of the organization of the african unity in 1964 talks about colonial frontiers be respected in case there is a clear line of uti possidetis then this would prevail over inconsistent practice of the legal title further if there is no clear legal title then the effective rights which includes colonial effective rights post colonial effective rights or recent effective rights will play an essential role in showing the title so this particular doctrine promotes the idea of stability and it says that you possess and you continue to possess whatever you are possessing right now and you do not change the territorial boundaries you change only on certain based on certain grounds as we have already discussed which may be based on right to self determination largely under the garb of or largely to remove colonization largely to avoid any sort of colonial domination but we have seen getting it used otherwise also as i have already explained now let us discuss this case a uh, falkland island dispute which is between uk and argentina wherein the island falkland island is in proximity to argentina but the claim is that of britishers let us go through the facts and the facts are that british sea captain or the history is that british sea captain in 1592 discovered the island in 1764 there was competing act of sovereignty the east falkland island was under french the west falkland island was under britishers in 19, in 1767 we see french sold it to spain in 1770 british settlement was conquered by spaniards but returned in the following year in 1774 british settlement abandoned for economic reasons but a plague asserting sovereignty was left behind in 1811 spaniards left in 1816 united province of the river plate that is argentina declared their independence from spain and four years later took formal possession of the island since argentina was a spanish colony and later on wanted to unite all of its island along with its main territory but the problem in this particular aspect was was that 
the island was under the control of Britishers. In 1829, British protested and two years later, an American warship evicted Argentinian settlers. In 1833, British captured the island. This lay in combination of discovery and occupation. Yes, certainly it was discovered by the Britishers as we have already seen. And at the same time, they continued to display their occupation that is possession over the island. However, it was questionable in the given circumstances since Argentina was colonized by Spaniards and then it got free and wanted to have control over the island. Whereas from Argentinians, it was taken forcefully. It would perhaps have been preferable to rely on conquest and subsequent annexation for in 1830s as it was perfectly legal as a method of acquiring territory. However, it was not claimed for political reasons. By 1930s, UK approach shifted to prescription as the basis of title. However, this was problematic since Argentina was protesting since 1833. In, 230, in 2013, referendum happened which went in favour of UK. It can be said that conquest formed the basis of title irrespective of British employment of other principles. Now friends, apart from the territory that we see, apart from the jurisdiction that we see getting applicable over those territories by the states, there are certain areas which are known as common heritage of mankind which I have already explained and the law of air and space. Now this common heritage of mankind is a concept wherein the property belongs to all but for the purposes of preservation and to be used for the development and for the development of mankind. In 1970, United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution, declaration of principles governing the seabed and ocean floor and it was noted that the area in question and its resources were the common heritage of mankind. Article 136 and 137 of UNCLOS or we can refer to Article 1 of the 1979 Moon Treaty, Moon and its natural resources are considered to be common heritage of mankind. No state as per the treaty should be allowed or can be allowed to claim its territory over moon. The law of airspace after first world war, security implications of the use of airspace above territory, therefore exercise of sovereignty, sovereign powers in airspace above territory acceptable on the grounds of security and regulation of flights over land territory. So this there was lack of understanding as to whether the airspace above the land surface should also be included within the domain of territory. Can state also have jurisdiction as far as airspace above the land territory is concerned since already to an extent we see that in sea water the territorial expansion has taken place up to 12 nautical mile and jurisdictional expansion has taken place up to 24 nautical mile after 12 nautical mile and to certain extent in EEZ as well. So, airspace above then was also recognized to be part of the territory and a state can exercise its jurisdiction in the airspace above. So, in 1919 Paris Convention for Regulation of Aerial Navigation came which recognized full sovereignty of states over airspace above their land and territorial sea. So, we see that outer space is also a regime which was earlier considered to be res communis and uh, it is free for all and can be used by all. There are certain prohibitions with respect to use of weapons where it, wherein the treaty on principles governing the activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space including moon and other celestial body in 1967 says no nuclear weapons to be placed, no military activity, no national activity, flag state would be responsible absolutely in case of any mishap towards other state in outer space. So, there is a convention on international liability for damage caused by space objects in 1972 which entails absolute liability upon the state that causes any mishap. With this, I end the topic and lecture for the day. Thank you so much. Namaskar.